Alex. Good morning, everyone. Well, um, morning. my name is Robert Copeland. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with uh, Cloudport uh, Logistics uh, Systems, Inc. The moderator that was going to be here today, Mark Zawicki, uh, who's our CAO, uh, had an emergency, so I'm standing in for him today. Uh, so I'm going to start out. I'm the moderating for these three gentlemen here, uh, Phil Vanek, uh, Lane Martin, and Bob Weinleck. Oh, Weinleck. Very close. Weinleck. Yeah. Close. Okay. Uh, I have a script to read for you guys, so I'm going to read that first so I don't miss anything that Mark would uh, like to get across. So first of all, welcome to the Logistics Automation and Standards Workshop hosted by Cell, Cell and Gene Meeting of Mesa. Uh, our first panel of the day will deal with the systems integration logistics management. Systems integration is defined as the process of aggregating components, subsystems into our co cooperative systems that are able to deliver the overarching functionality and the act as a coordinating whole. The integration process includes both physical and informatic process integration activities. <clears throat> With the first CAR-T program achieving commercial approval this summer, the multiple additional programs anticipated in the coming months, regenerative therapy commercialization is no longer a theoretical potential, but is now a commercial reality. This reality requires the scientific community to rapidly establish scalable processes for managing complexi complexities of the rapidly evolving space. We will discuss these complexities and requirements during the workshop this morning. And I've already introduced our three panelists. So Phil is the GM from Cell Therapy Strategy at GE Healthcare. Lane Martin is the Vice President, General Manager, Specialty Distribution Solutions at McKesson. And Bob Weinleck, COO and CCO, Board of Directors of Dysgenics. I believe, do you guys see the screen here? Yes. So please turn your attention to the slide behind or to the side of me. This slide illustrates a schematic representation of physical informatic processes required to successfully support cell therapy, clinical and commercial <coughs> activity. The solid lines depict physical asset transfer and the dotted are data transfer requirements. We will use these slide, this slide to guide our discussion topics during the panel discussion. We will be focusing on six specific topics during our discussion. One is patient management, which I believe is right in the center in the, to the bottom. Uh, two is logistics. Three is manufacturing. Four is payer process and reimbursement. Five is systems integration, which is the physical as asset and data management. And then data management, which is the part of data integration. We'll start with the topic one, patient management, which covers the segments of one, six, seven, and eight on the slide. Remember this panel is focused on system integration. We will only be discussing this during the panel. This includes patient and physician scheduling, patient chain of identity, which must be established and maintained using appropriate systems and procedural controls. Areas involved would include customer service, source material collection, call center, patient and physician scheduling, and supporting services. The other is information management, patient data management, and outcome data management. So my first question would be to McKesson, would be Lane. Uh, can you please provide a synopsis of how McKesson is looking at managing patient data and related support areas, and how you can integrate your process into sponsored ERP as well as partner scheduling, manufacturing, and distribution systems. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I guess I'd take a look at, at this schematic and, and maybe if we transition that into the patient journey, I think that's somewhat illustrative to how we think about this market. I mean, we've got a couple of analogs today of products that are either on the market or imminent in the market. And when I think about those, um, you know, you've got a significant amount of activity that has to happen at the point where the patient uh, is prescribed uh, a, a course of, of, uh, of treatment. And at that point, you've got a number of things around benefits investigation and prior authorization. You've got to figure out how to navigate the system to get this, this patient 
onto therapy. And, and that really looks like a hub for the most part. And then beyond the, the traditional hub activities, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of questions to be asked around how do you get <clears throat> a patient from where they present to a point of care. Uh, if you think about the current analogs, that, that's a non-trivial process. And I think the world's going to look uh, more and more complex as we see broader indications written for for um, these types of therapies. So we see it through a, um, a world of how do you get from a, a patient where they present either in a hospital or a <coughs> clinic setting into um, and how do they manage their way through the, uh, the payer process to get out of <coughs> therapy and then how do you get them to a center of excellence if that's where they have to do um, their, uh, their cell line Work and then how do you and how do you start this process before we even really get to that first step of logistics where you'll see uh, cells start to move into a manufacturing process. So that's really how we see it, and uh, you know this is how McKesson has oriented itself in the marketplace for the last you know ten years as specialty has become a reality in, in kind of the our distribution marketplace. We have ceased to be what I think most people would think of as being their their dad's distribution company, and we've become much more of a full line commercial enterprise that helps to support these patient journeys for manufacturers in the market. So this is really a next evolution mm -hmm. in, that, uh, in that journey, and I think this is as transformative to the uh, supply chain as you know, specialty products and biologics products were 10 years ago. Do you see more of it a challenge, just a, a question from a logistics side, from a pharmaceutical distribution to mm -hmm. general stores and pharmacies? Do you see any comparisons? Sorry, do I see comparisons with a more of a needle to needle approach from a patient direct? Well, with systems wise. Well, I mean, <laughs> systems wise. I guess I see this as being. Uh, I, I see this as being very transformative. I, I guess is, I'd say, and and I don't think there are. <clears throat> you've got to still think about what do I? How do I as a patient? Um, navigate through this therapy. There's going to be a lot of coordination of care. There are a lot of things that, that look very different than the traditional, I'm going to go to my clinician, I'm going to um, you know, be told I'm going to sit in a chair and I'm going to get uh, a, a script taken with me to be able to have my, my, uh, my therapy at home. Yes. Um, this, this looks entirely differently. And I think that's how we, we have really been spending our time in the last you know, 18 to 24 months thinking about all right, given this clinical journey that, that this patient now has to undertake, what do we need to do differently? And that's where I think, from a hub perspective, it comes down to how do you ensure that all of the different players in, the, in, the, in this journey for the patient get the right products on hand to be able to, to administer care, possibly to be able to monitor for AEs, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, transport patients if that's what's needed. Um, you know, to be able to help uh, bring this journey along. I don't know if that quite gets to your, but I don't find this to be, I think that's not really comparable to much anything that's happened in the past, really, other than Correct. the fact that you've got a patient who is, uh, who is ill and who needs to, to be uh, cared for. I think what's going to happen is, as some of these therapies make their way through the clinical pathway towards approval and commercialization, some of these are going to become and be established as new standards of care. Mm -hmm. for certain types of therapy. And I think, you know, from a payers, you're going to look at some of these and say, how is the current treatment paradigm going to be disruptive or change with these? And then the treatment modality for delivering these therapies will become more defined or established. And I think mm -hmm. we, as uh, those of us who are therapy <coughs> developers and, and the rest of the supply chain, have to look at, you know, not just clinical that get it approved, and then yes. what do I do? I mean, because then you're, you're really behind eight ball, but really think with commercialization in mind, yeah. you know, with the payers, with the caregivers, how is that model of treatment going to change? And how do I supply that? You know, and, yeah. and that everything we have on this flow chart really ties into that from logistics to the treatment to how things are stored. If you look at the diversity of therapies from cell and gene therapy to, you know, how they're uh, administered, how they're uh, frozen, stored, there's a tremendous diversity yes. um, right. that's coming out of this. And if you look at, you know, all these that'll come through is where are they going to be stored? Are, are they in hospital, outpatient, you know, separate mm -hmm. clinics, all the logistics that fit that treatment modality and site of care? Yeah. You know, we really have to be able to make that work. 
Well, and that's right. And, and I don't think this, when, when, you, when you think about logistics, I mean, it can be, that's a pretty tricky word when you're thinking about this, this particular dynamic. It, logistics of moving the, the, the cells themselves, I mean, while that's incredibly valuable to uh, the supply chain, it's really not the distributor's role in, in, in this particular case. Um, the distributor is much more focused on, on the patient access in the front end and on some of the licensure and some of the, um, some of the, the order to cash processes at the end. But the distribution process itself, as McKesson has thought of it, kind of doesn't really look anything like a traditional model. So this has been a, a this is an interesting set of, of therapies that were really, I think, transform how standard distribution has worked. I think some of those modalities you talked about, I think that's spot on. That really is, hits home for us as well. Now I'm going to direct my, the next question uh, to Bob as well. Uh, can you discuss, from a sponsor's perspective, what issues have you encountered in managing and structuring multiple inbound data streams within your systems? Well, I think there, there's a number of things you have involved. I mean, a lot of it starts with your clinical experience and what your trial is like. In our case, we have you know double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled. So you have, you know, from a clinical logistic standpoint, blinding that takes place of, of what you know patients that get randomized, whether they get one of the doses or they get a placebo or one of the controls in there. So logistically, you manage the flow of that and all the tracking. You have to maintain the blinding. So there's a lot of logistics there within the clinical part. Mm -hmm. to ensure the successful execution of your study in there. Now, as you, you go from that to a commercial experience, it changes. I think, you know, everyone who's a technology developer, you look at, you have what is your clinical product, essentially, how it's packaged, how it's administered, and then you look, you know, what is your commercial or phase three product going to look like? Is it delivered in a different way? Is the, is the kit become more elegant, how it's delivered? Uh, is the storage going to be different? All these things are going to transition, and, and when you work with supply chain partners towards your commercial product, you're, you're going to have a lot of these things that have to evolve. It's going to be the packaging, it's going to be your, your cryo storage, the cryo ship, and how are you going to store it at the site? You know, all these things, you know, while you're executing your, your, your clinical programs in the initial phases, you're going to be working parallel path towards, you know, what is your, your commercial product going to be and, and how you intend to supply, how are you going to work on inventory management? And I know we'll talk about more of these things. Perfect. Well, to segue into the next topic, which is the logistics piece of it, uh, from the Cryoport's pr perspective is having a, an API architecture, an open network that links into many of the communication tools that are going to have to feed into a system so we can coordinate this at, much a, at a, a quicker, faster level uh, of communication and data management. Uh, being a carrier agnostic, we use multiple carriers because there's just not a set lane of transfer. Just, it's all dependent on where the patient's located and where the material is going to be housed at the time to, for these uh, sources. Uh, the regulatory compliance plays a big piece in it from being in the manufacturing side to the logistics, the transportation, the warehousing, and then just the data management and mining of patient data and of that side. And then defining SOPs and that whole line of communication and structure being established as well. Um, and this has been another question for Bob from Dysgenics. Uh, Dysgenics is addressing logistics management, particularly when biotech has multiple partners in a space in the support of their programs. Uh, how do you look at managing that? Well, I, I think you, you really have to look at it from your, your quality system perspective first. I mean, you know, obviously, there's multiple things. If you're manufacturing your product, you look at your compliance to, you know, uh, all the CGMP requirements, whether it's U.S.-based or some of the international entities. So you're manufacturing, then you translate to any of your partners, obviously, profit or auditing, you know, all the quality system components. And, and if those of you who are developing a, a therapy, you know, your, your quality system evolves as you go down the pathway. In, in there, yeah. so it, it, it's it's a key thing to your compliance and your further approvals and licensure down the road, and that goes to all your vendors, whether it's you know people uh, that are supplying your 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 culture equipment, your media, or it's your logistical suppliers. You know that they have quality systems that dovetail into yours, um, and, and you're covering all the bases. If you look at you know the pathway you go through. You know, compliance is a key thing to ensuring, you know, you, you can actually get approved with your therapy and, and to make sure you're doing all the right steps. So, 
you know, making sure that tracking takes place, all the connectivity to the patient tracking for, you know, uh, doses, your therapy and clinical use to, you know, longer term traceability from a commercial standpoint. Mm -hmm. all right. uh, the next topic on this is the manufacturing side of it. Uh, manufacturing is a critical component that impacts the workflow of any given cell therapy program. Manufacturing include, includes, but not only the modifications of the host material, but also the scaling of the cells, as well as cryo uh, preservation. These processes can vary dramatic, dramatically based on the nature of the therapy and whether it is allogeneric or autologous therapy. Systems integration considerations include coordinating, scheduling, patient procedures, logistic support, as well as release of materials from quality perspectives. Uh, for Phil uh, with GE, uh, if GE is addressing the integration of their process and equipment in support of overall systems management uh, of cell therapy production. So I think it's, we really kind of dove right into the discussion into some of the logistics and, and movement of materials. And I think it's important to step back for a second and just uh, think about sort of what's happening at the healthcare level, right? Mm -hmm. There's increasing precision personalization of medicine. These are, for the large part, and uh, autologous and allogeneic together, these are living materials. The living materials come with a, their own genetic, back, you know, genetic mm -hmm. background. They come with their own sort of heterogeneic uh, cell populations. They come with quite a bit of complexity that has not been there historically. Manufacturing these we talk quite about, a bit about this, that transition from, at one point it's a patient record, patient sample, and patient material. Suddenly in the manufacturing paradigm or the manufacturing environment, it becomes a sample. Yes. It gets de-identified to sort of comply, at least in the US regulations, with a number of the requirements there. Then at some point, that, that uh, chain of identity and chain of custody has to be maintained through that manufacturing process to get handed back to the clinic, where it gets reconnected back to the patient for administration. The, um, the, the third part is that uh, th there's quite a bit of um, integration between the manufacturing and environment in the clinic. Now, as a company like GE, we can be fairly agnostic to whether the manufacturing is done at the point of care, if mm -hmm. it's done within a manufacturing center at the hospital, or if it's done halfway around the world. To us, it doesn't really matter. But there's a few things that do matter, right? The heterogeneity of the cell as an inbound material and the fact that there is in fact in the supply chain an inbound material that has to get connected into the manufacturing process plus that uh, the variability of that material coming into the process. We don't have time to dwell on sort of all the complexity of production, expansion, manufacturing, but that's something, it, it's very different. The material coming in for every different patient going into a process A, B, or C is going to be uh, run through in a particular way. So ultimately in the manufacturing, expansion, harvesting, washing, there has to be two fundamental principles that are adhered to. Quality control, quality assurance to de-risk it and to make sure that that information gets attached to the sample and then ultimately back to the patient. And then the second thing is <clears throat> sort of that entire um, uh, orchestration that has to take place of where's the sample, where's the material moving through the process, is it on time? Because if you think about it, a little ripple in a manufacturing environment can uh, cause a tidal wave through the whole distribution, supply chain, yes. logistics management. So, you know, we're touching on a lot of topics, but I'd, I'd say that the biological complexity, the sort of the orchestration and the scheduling that's driven by that uh, uh, biological uh, diversity, and then also maintaining the quality assurance of the product on the outbound side are things that we're always thinking about. And I think the thing there, too, is that, you know, we're so focused on, I think, the patient, the therapy um, that, can, that can help people and, and, and many in, in, in a lot of instances. We, we can't forget, too, that we have to be able to make our organizations work as a business. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and that means really, I, I think, adding to something Phil's talking about here is you have to look at how you capture demand properly for, for the therapy at, at the patient care sites. How do you capture the information? How do you handle that from scheduling? And, you know, Phil mentioned, obviously, you're using, you know, uh, tissue base, you know, other raw materials that are very sensitive from a time to transport to how they're processed effectively. And some of those things are going to be JIT. This isn't running a CNC machine and making a device mm -hmm. out of metal or plastic. It's a very different process. And we have to think as to that lead time to do that, everything that's involved, and then our, our, our final product, in, in most instances, is going to be a cryo-frozen vial bag. It, it could be a syringe. That's different than maintaining 
uh, many widgets that are made of a, a solid, you know, inert material. I mean, right. so you have to be very careful how you manage it, your inventory exposure, the risk of that inventory, mm -hmm. you know, all the natural disasters, hurricanes, and things of that nature. Do you keep all that cryofrozen product in one site? Do you decentralize it? Mm -hmm. And the cost of maintaining inventory in multiple locations uh, yes. and, and, and the exposure of that from obsolescence and risk. So, you know, we're thinking right now of, you know, getting through clinicals, delivering that, but, but really there's a lot of business decisions as organizations we have to look at to make this work as viable commercial enterprises. Yes. Well, that's, there's a there's great points in there, and this is really where, you know, this is where, again, the distributor comes in, because we find ourselves as companies exit that preclinical phase and start getting into commercial phases of their product, this is where demand management is going to largely come from, you know, our provider networks and their EMRs are going to be where you're going to find those, those sources of data. And that's really, again, where that rubber is going to hit the road on the commercial side is starting to figure out what role does, uh, does a distributor or a hub within the distributor have to play in helping to, to manage some of those sort of flows of information. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the sort of the complexity of this supply chain more broadly, um, when people talk about sort of the sticker shock of some of these prices and the cost, we always are trying to say, look, the, the most important thing we can do as an industry today is de-risk everything in the supply yes. chain, including in the manufacturing. And to do that, what, what do we have to do? Simplify the processes, take some steps out, um, better coordinate. Uh, what drives error? Labor, humans, right? Human drives error and yes. the, the multiple data entry. So the more that you can sort of tackle those yeah. elements, take the data entry out so that systems are much more um, uh, synchronized and connected and aligned. Um, and then sort of start to build in systems in manufacturing or any of the other parts where you're sort of um, co collecting information in real time on the fly, GPS positioning, all of that information. You should not have somebody sitting there with a clipboard logging things and, you know, barcoding. In those days we're going to have to evolve if we're going to be treating hundreds of thousands of patients in the next few years. Yes. Speed will play a big part in this. And another question for you, uh, Bob, is can you provide a brief overview of dysgenics? and how they're looking at uh, integration of patient logistics and manufacturing systems. Yeah, so in, in our paradigm, we're an allogeneic therapy, and, and it, we have a, uh, it's a cryofrozen progenitor cell that is basically delivered at a totally outpatient point of care. So it's a spinal injection that's done, so it's out of the hospital. So as we look at things there, um, you know, we'll be working with clinics, and this is an elective procedure in there. So I, I think, you know, as I try to take our paradigm and apply it to others' therapies in here, some are going to be more of a, a chronic treatment that are delivered in a hospital to a very critically ill patient. In our circumstance, we'll typically have schedule information that we'll look at. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, large spine treatment centers, for example, that'll have scheduled patients that'll do, you know, let's say 20 to 30 uh, treatments per week you know, we'll certainly look at them as a center of excellence, you know, that would have um, uh, bigger cryo storage on site, and, and perhaps they may order their uh, therapeutic doses um, on, a, on a fixed basis, uh, where we'll ship, you know, once a week, you know, in larger batches. At the same time, you might have a smaller clinic that might only do one or two treatments per week. In that case, they wouldn't warrant having a larger on-site, uh, you know, cryo or LN2 Storage. unit, they might just use a cryoport shipper to maintain that per each dose in there. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of what we're going to do is look at how is the reorder process based upon a treatment schedule at a clinic or hospital based? How do you as the manufacturer capture that? And, and depending on how you're going to distribute, if you're working through a McKesson a supply yeah. chain partner, if you're directly going to ship as the manufacturer, to the site, that flow of information. And you, you can't just use that information to ship what you have in inventory right now. That has to go into your ERP system for your demand forecast and how you schedule your production. Because these have significant implications on your ability to run your manufacturing, the inbound uh, tissue requirements you have, procurement of that, and everything else that trails through it. So you have to look at it more of a holistic approach from you know, how you capture that demand of existing centers, and then also as you, you grow your penetration for your therapy, how you're going to capture that demand that's incoming, yeah. and what assumptions you make on scheduling for manufacturing. Yeah, and, and you know, even if you, uh, you know, even if you think about the dynamic, you know, the, some of the dynamics you were just talking about, you know, how you get the product to its site of care, whether you use a 
traditional distributor or not, I think is, 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 is definitely um, irrelevant to us. So we, we see this as a commercial um, solution for a manufacturer where if it's, even if it's a, um, even if you're doing a direct ship, you know, how many, how many of the companies in the room today want to invest in their own, uh, you know, finished goods kind of warehousing and their own order to cash processes? I mean, these are not things that are, that are, are small investments and they, they rarely are, are they good investments for, for companies who are trying to bring a, a single product to market. So outsource those, you know, into, um, you know, licensure is a non-trivial matter. Are you trying to figure out ways to get, um, you know, your, your data around where your product is going to deal mm -hmm. with the credit risks and all the order to cash processes that essentially the, the supply chain has built um, at a scale level across the industry already. So taking, access, taking advantage of those things at the end, that's actually um, harder than people assume, right? Once, I, once I've gone through all these fantastic processes, I got this great product, I understand exactly how the <laughs> provider is gonna, going to write, I understand how the, the storage is going to happen in the site, but how am I going to get it there? Yeah. Um, that, that's something that we talk a lot about with our, with our supply chain partners and just trying to emphasize that, uh, that taking advantage of the services that are in the marketplace, even if you go direct, um, are a great benefit to, to our partners. The one area, I think just to add a layer on top of that, I think one area we don't pay enough attention to is you know, this whole, the robustness of the supply chain and the delivery path back into the clinic. So let's make an assumption that you're actually producing somewhere, whether it's off-site or slightly remote to a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. That material has to go back to the clinic. It has yep. to go back and perhaps even be reformulated at the clinic. And at times it even has to then be uh, in a format that the physicians will like to use and they're familiar with. So we tend to, you know, as an industry, we adopt tools that are borrowed heavily from bioprocessing, from blood processing, radio pharmacies, et cetera. So we kind of force feed those tools back into the clinical setting. And I think for real uh, large scale uptake, we kind of have to think about this vein to vein comprehensive solution where, you know, um, the fill finish is impacted by the decision that ultimately, how do you reformulate at the point of care? How do you thaw? Is it frozen uh, mm -hmm. upon distribution? Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't get thawed, does it get uh, reformulated, and then is it administered through a catheter, through a uh, you know, syringe? What, what is the mechanism? So I think holistically, if we think through some of those downstream processes, we need to know now because it impacts what we're doing in the manufacturing. And I think to that point is, uh, you know, to the need to know now, I, I think a lot of us are making decisions on what is, you know, a, a phase three or commercial product based yeah. upon technologies and things that are out now. And, and at the same time, we're trying to anticipate what's going to be available in three, four years when we're getting to more of that BLA or, you know, our market authorization in Japan or other, whatever it may be, is, you know, decisions we make now that, that lock us in or uh, affect our flexibility down the road. So we're, we're still an adolescent industry. We started coming to this meeting five years ago. If we look at just what's changed from a technology standpoint, whether it's means of uh, producing your cells, the technology, or even you know, a cryo shipment and storage, these things are evolving. So I think we all have to anticipate what best fits our respective therapies, what decisions we make now, and ultimately what we want that to be when we get towards commercial and, and the flexibility we have to amend that technology or adjust as we get into our phase three of commercial products. Yeah, there's not a lot of industries where um, we have a finished product, the cost of goods is anywhere 50, 100, $150,000 that we so cavalierly Put it in a you know a, a cryo pile somewhere. Throw yeah. it. Give it to somebody in the clinic and say, "You guys sort it out." Throw it in a water bath for thawing. For example, <laughs> you know, it's like hmm, I wouldn't want my Lamborghini treated that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to topic four: uh, payer process and reimbursement. So this one's for Lane with McKesson. One of the critical discussion topics in the space <clears throat> has been reimbursement. Uh, can you please outline the different approaches McKesson is taking to support these types of programs? This includes data transfer, product ownership, title of product, and the billing considerations, both as a sponsor and both as McKesson principal. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, this somewhat touches on some of the earlier points. That, I mean, the way that, uh, you know, the way that we think about some of these front end processes are, you know, are, uh, how do, you, how do you navigate that first step around um, patient enters the system, patient tries to get access and has to navigate a potentially very, very challenging uh, payer environment. 
Um, what if there's a RAMS on the product? What if there are um, you know, any number of clinical barriers, not to mention, uh, you know, it be there's a, a series of therapies you have to navigate through first, maybe this is a second or a third or a fourth line product. So this is really where, again, uh, the hub is, is designed to help uh, navigate these, these systems for the patient. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, that, I mean, if I think about the schematic that's up on this, this, this is really where the beginning and the end process here, this is about how do you help that patient take that step um, to that clinic um, or hospital between you know step one and then on the on the on the back end when the when the product is going back out to the to the uh, provider for for administration is the right data that was gathered at the front end when you know indication and patient data all that is that being um, tied back to the product as it goes back into the point of administration and is that is that full uh, data set being being connected. And I think on that, the gates too, if you look at some of our therapies in, in there, you know, if, if you look at whether you're the manufacturer of the therapy, you're involved in the decision tree to allow that therapy to go to a site to treat a patient. Obviously, we've got the payers, we've got to have the prescription from the physician in there. But also, if you look at, uh, depending on the technique of administration, it is training yes. uh, of, of the physician, the site to do that, which is paramount. And then also, it's going to be then is, you know, that decision to release that therapy to that clinic. Yeah. So, you know, you have to look at the decision tree where that, where that data comes in. Does it, if there's a supply chain partner, does it go to the partner and it comes back to the manufacturer saying this site is live and okay to go? Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of parameters we have to think about because one of the key things we're going to have with therapies is that we're going to make sure it's getting uh, delivered to the proper clinicians who are trained to administer this therapy, the right patient selection. The worst thing we want to have is get our therapies out, get into the wrong hands because we can't control our, our supply chain process. And then you have AEs or, you know, you start having bad outcomes because you're, you're not controlling where your therapy goes out to. That's right. Um, and, and going back to the Lamborghini reference that was made here, I mean, I think this has been a big shift for, for us as well And that, you know, traditionally hubs are really good at running programs for, uh, you know, thousands of patients and uh, in taking a lot of phone calls and navigating kind of set processes. I think this transformative here is, we, and, you know, we've gone through a number of, uh, of acquisitions in the last couple of years where we've ended up getting into more boutique hub offerings that, that really do um, specialize the, the services to a single patient. You know, maybe, maybe this, is a, this is not a thousands or hundreds of thousands of patient population we're talking about, you know, 17. How, how do you manage that that process on a specialized level so that it's not um, it's not a, a Volvo, it's a it's a Lamborghini that we're talking about taking care of and and, and managing through this process. Nice. Um, let's switch on to uh, topic five, which is systems integration, uh, the physical asset and data management. Uh, this one will go to. To GE. I'm going to read this to all of you, whichever one wants yeah. answered. Yeah. Moving to a broader topic, the overall integration of a system uh, for processes, uh, the integration within manufacturing process, uh, the different types of sets for, of equipment, cell modifications, mm -hmm. processing, scaling, purification, and cryopreservation. Uh, addressing the systems integration process and how well uh, is the data uh, continuity, continuity, continuity yeah. uh, held within your systems. So if you think about a complex un, uh, multi-unit operation based workflow, right, and all of us probably in some uh, capacity or other work in these environments, lots of different pieces of equipment, very often these pieces of equipment come from different manufacturers, certainly the material coming from the apheresis center, they choose, <clears throat> they choose whatever the operator wants to use, three or four different pieces of equipment goes to the manufacturing center, gets processed to support whatever the therapeutic modality is in the cell type. Those devices in an ideal world all come from GE, but they don't today. So um, uh, we have to live with the reality that not only um, as we acquire new unit operations, we have to first and foremost get the devices to actually communicate together through, and communicate uh, in a way that they're controllable in a user environment so that they're familiar, right? Again, we talked earlier about uh, adding complexity. The last thing you want to bring into a manufacturing environment is a device that is 
very complicated, um, lots of data entry and lots of disconnectedness to up and downstream components. So um, as, the, as these platforms evolve, the first thing that we have to do is address sort of the continuity of the environment and sort of that, the, the, that, uh, that ability for operators to be trained in an easy fashion to be able to manage this process. <laughs> Then what we have to think about is, okay, well, there's other pieces of equipment that these processes are dependent on. There's QC labs that some of these things might get, uh, materials might get shipped out mm -hmm. to and returned back to. So what you have is a hodgepodge of all these different components and people are stitching this together today. Um, and the best way to make that work is sort of A, to start to connect it into limb systems and start to look for uh, box, well, at the first level, box level integration. The next one is to start to connect it in through devices such as uh, asset performance management tools that we provide as other vendors provide as well, so that there's a common architecture that these materials feed data in and out. Yes. That data going in and out uh, can be do doing one of two things. It could be just for uh, data, um, uh, data management, connection into the QMS, quality management, manufacturing environment, so that, that there's a record of production. The second thing you want to do is start to collect information about what the devices are actually doing. Are they on performance? Are they in spec, out of spec, et cetera? All of that gets aggregated. From there, we haven't even started to talk about aggregating that up into an area where you can start to be predictive and analytical about what is the demand. I think, you, Bob, you talked a little bit about that. You know, the demand that's coming in a particular um, environment. I know this is something other industries have dealt with in the past. So we kind of think about it at three layers, the box level, communication mm -hmm. up into limbs, so you've got a process level and into that middleware layer, and then ultimately you get up analytics. where you can actually do some more sophisticated analytics and, and bring it together. And more organically, too, you know, I think those, those organizations, whether they're going to do their own manufacturing or, or use a CMO, is critical process parameters when you go to your commercial processes. Yeah. What is it you, you critically have to monitor in there, you know, to look at what your cells are doing? Because as you close and automate your system, you're, you're going to take operator error and, and automate this to take that variability out of it. So you're going to be looking at very specific parameters to ensure uniformity from lot to lot of manufacture that ties into the equipment and the various parameters and systems that Phil was referring to. So you, you have to look with the ends and means as, as you, you, you optimize that phase three process to those critical things you're looking at. That brings us into topic six, uh, data management. Uh, this is open question for everyone as well, is on how, how are you guys dealing with the data management and integration, and what's, what's the future look like with combining these into more of a one platform that communicates with the multiple ones as you explained earlier of okay. the different segments within the supply chain and manufacturing yeah. piece of it and the patient driven. So I'll touch on it just strictly from the, the cell therapy manufacturer and, and I think then Phil and, and everyone can chime in relative to the supply chain and, and the equipment part of it is that you know I know ourselves as, as a clinical stage company is, is looking at what are the commercial level databases and operating systems we need to have. We know some type of limbs, ERP system, order to cash, mm -hmm. these things, uh, qu various quality uh, system type databases in there. So certain ones need to connect. Obviously, you need to have information from the site as far as demand go into a scheduling in there. You have to have all your quality documentation, uh, documentation track when you have order to cash you know, that flow through uh, of, of orders, processing, you know, revenue, all those things have to integrate. So you really have to kind of map it out based upon what your model is going to look like, your, your manufacturing flow process, the different uh, things you have to integrate, what your supply chain, you know, uh, from a distribution standpoint is going to look like, who you're going to interface with if you're working with McKesson, for example, how you're going to communicate with them. Um, so all these things, you have to kind of look at it from where you're at right now in your stage of your company, <coughs> what's appropriate, but, but really to benchmark and map out what you're going to have to have to support commercial. Mm -hmm. So from, again, just building off of that foundation, right, we talked a little bit about the box level integration and all of that. Um, we recognized, I think, pretty early on that this is more complex than just a manufacturer. It's the clinical settings. It's, there's lots of components. We've talked to um, therapy providers and clinical centers, which were using up to 15 different software tools to actually aggregate information and manage their entire clinical um, cell therapy workflow. So, 
um, we, we come at it a, probably three different ways. The first and foremost is at the box level, simplifying the devices, making them harmonize so that anything that comes from GE looks like GE, feels like GE, and you get mm -hmm. familiar with one operating system. That's a common practice, whether it's bioprocessing at GE or any of our other sort of platforms. The second thing that we do is we kind of look to orchestrate at the process level using tools from GE Digital. GE's made a sizable investment in digital platforms. You hear us talk about the internet of things and sort of that need mm -hmm. for connectivity. So we leverage tools and technologies that exist inside the business, but that are solving problems in aviation, solving problems in transportation, gas and power, et cetera. So we kind of pull from what exists. We don't feel we have to reinvent too much of this content or material. Um, but then there was still that part that was a little bit different than any other industry before, right? It's that vein-to-vein -vein logistics management. And then about a year and a half ago, we, in partnership with Mayo Clinic and GE Ventures, spun out a company, Vinetti, Vinetruvi Networks at the time, mm -hmm. Vinetti now. <clears throat> And I think Vinetti has a unique position where they kind of look at this from the perspective of network orchestration. What are all the moving pieces? How do they plug in together? And then how do we leverage assets that are available today to make it more seamless, more simplified, with a major focus on chain of custody and chain of identity? And then finally, I think that the, the last thing that we do is we recognize that because this industry is not, you know, you're not gonna go out and buy one device, one technology, one factory. We have a group which is really built around sort of providing broader solutions. So, being an orchestrator internally from a commercial and transactional side, but also consultative a little bit. Look at the workflow, work with people, do process development, try to simplify, try to integrate all of the manufacturing steps, and then provide other solutions, how it might connect at factory level, at logistics level, at the clinical level. And I think for um, a commercial partner like us, we're going to see we're going to see a highly variable solution set here. I think we're going to see standards that are going to develop. You know, probably <coughs> somewhere between two and two thousand standards will develop in the short term, and then that'll, we'll we'll settle in around the, the, the usual five to ten standards for how these are going to be. But right now, I mean, we're seeing manufacturers who are looking to do everything uh, internally. You know, they're, they're bringing every sort of data into their own uh, database, which may be very, is not going to be a very complicated database at that, um, trying to figure out how this is going to work. Um, yes. it, but we're going to see, uh, you know, GE will, will certainly help to you know, future, to develop standards that will, that will make this better in the future. But, like, then there's going to be, you know, five other ones, and we're going to see them all. Mm -hmm. um, where I guess that does for us is we have to be variable and flexible because our, you know, if you, you know, you think about the hub's role in this process and the EMR's role in this process, the provider's role in the process, how are they, how are we going to help get that data into every single uh, modality out there um, yes. for, for how this data is going to be captured and collected? Um, it's a non-trivial thing. So we're really, we focus on flexibility. We focus on, on being, um, you know, there to develop to, to basically hit fit any standard that might that might evolve, that's that's really going to be a challenge for us. That is, that is also coming in the face of you know, paradigm shifts around how product is getting to where it's going. How are we going to to help um, you, know, you know, manage these data flows for, you know, two partners today and two hundred in the future. Exactly. Bob. Yeah, I think the key thing once again comes down to you know what what things you as, as a company, a technology manufacturer, what is your critical data you need in there uh, to, to manage? So we, we know obviously, you know, the, the schedule of the clinic in there, what's your demand, how are you going to basically communicate to ship that out? You, you have to look at data flow as to <coughs> your, your incoming tissue use as a source, your manufacturing. So I think it's really understanding, you know, per organization, what is your critical information you need to run your business, whether it's through the clinical phase or into commercial, and then as you work with logistics partners is interfacing with them to basically build your program. And I, I think, you know, we have to look at it, you know, we look at it from a silo right now, but, you know, a lot of uh, organizations are be going through the same thing. So things are going to kind of weave a, a network in there, but it's just really understanding what are your parameters, what critical information do you need to manage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I need to wrap this up here. Uh, really the overall question uh, related to systems and integration that we haven't discussed today, any predictions that you see for integration evolving in the next five years? 
Yeah, I, I'll, maybe I'll start and go down this way. I, I think, look, this is, at the end of the day, this is biology. Biology is messy, it's unpredictable today. I think that what will change in the next five years as we start to assemble these tools and technologies, as we aggregate data and as we start to be more analytical in our approaches, we will start to see things that we don't know today. And that will inform processes in the future and we'll start to make biology less complex. And when it becomes less complex, it will be much more manageable. <clears throat> I see a couple of things. I think that uh, you know, as this field uh, progresses, we're going to start to see larger indications that um, that will change the whole uh, commercial process dramatically. I think you're also going to start seeing, you know, I don't know, five years, maybe maybe five to ten years, you'll start to see more competition across ind indications, and then that will change the payer landscape dramatically. Um, so I, I think those are the two things that will really, you know, what happens when this becomes mainstream in the sense of I'm not managing 17 patients, I'm managing 17,000, and what happens when I've got three different therapies that are all targeting the, the same types of, uh, of, of patient groups. So, and that's, that, those are the things I think will really affect it, and that's what we're trying to, to encourage our partners to, to think about in advance as well. And I think just real quick here, you know, we're, we're looking at the paradigm of how the treatment models and, and the sites are set up right now, and then we're adapting to it. I think as we look at some of these uh, broader therapy treatments in, in, in my organization, since we, we have a population that, that is millions that can be treated, is how the centers of care and sites are going to adapt yeah. to take advantage of some of these uh, paradigms in, in care changes. So. Mm -hmm. There's going to be changes happening on the treatment centers and how they, they do business in treating the patients that we're going to have to work and accommodate to also. So I think we in our particular disease states have to anticipate what that may look like. Well, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you very much. And thank Bob, Lane, and Phil for joining today. Thanks, everyone.